Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Topical Minds podcast. I am your host, Abdullah Khalifado, and today we will be speaking about an extremely important topic, which is how in this extremely competitive job market do I set myself up for success? My guest today is Mei Ji Hum. Mei is Director of Career Management Services and Corporate Partnerships at Concordia University's John Moulton School of Business. She works closely with employers to fulfill their campus recruitment needs. She also heads career development programming to promote John, John Molson student and alumni talent in the job market. So um, welcome to the show, May. Um, extremely excited to have you uh, on. Likewise. Thank you so much for the invitation, Abdullah. So um, one of the things, and of course, I did my MBA at Concordia University and um, took advantage of uh, um, your office, your team, and the invaluable insights that you provide to students. But I did want to uh, jump into uh, some of the sort of common mistakes that students do make when applying to jobs, um, as well as, you know, what in your mind are some of the key challenges that students um, face when looking to enter the job market? Sure. So I think one of the common mistakes lies with the uh, level of preparation or lack thereof, uh, especially in a very competitive job market. Students need to do their research. In fact, any job seeker needs to do their research and really um, take the time to craft a very solid application and really understand the needs of the position, the needs of the hiring organization and how that fits with their own profile and try to, you know, um, close those gaps. And I think um, in terms of um, best practices, you know, um, doing the preparation and seeking out that information in an effort to make an application stand out is key. And that's where there are so many tools available out there uh, for university students, a career center, just like you reaching out to speak to your career advisor, getting some industry intel and doing your own research on what the trends and the needs are and what direction potentially that industry may be going so that you have some substantial information to incorporate into either your cover letter or during the interview process. I think those uh, would really help. Got it. And how important is the, um, in the process, where does networking fit in? Um, what are some of the, you know, the tips on how to navigate through that? I know, of course, for students, they've got, uh, you know, the career fairs typically that they can take advantage of as well. How important is networking at those particular events, but then also outside of those events? Yes, networking is key. In fact, it's critical because it's relationship building and that you have an opportunity to create that uh, relationship, that bond with the recruiter so that they can be an advocate for your application once all those resumes come piling in and recruiters have to sift through them. And um, by networking, you know, it can be the traditional in-person type, uh, but also uh, virtual. So with LinkedIn, for instance, I strongly recommend uh, job seekers consider reaching out to recruiters um, and sending them an invitation to connect. Um, However, that being said, I do recommend writing a note, writing a note so that the recruiter sees that you took the time and effort to say, oh, we I uh, listened to your information session where you're looking to recruit for XY position. Um, I see a very good fit between my training, my experience, my education, and the needs of the position. Can we schedule a five-minute, ten-minute call um, just so we can go over my application um, and just reiterate your interest and the goodness of fit between your profile and the needs of the position. Yeah, it's so critical to have, you know, even making small changes, like having that no to go along with your invite makes such a big difference. And it's such a value add. Um, and recruiters do, you know, of course, like being in the job market myself now, um, you know, and having people reach out to me, I do, you know, see that there's definitely a benefit in somebody taking that time out and like putting down those few points that either they want to chat with you about or, you know, even just providing more of a context in terms of what it is they're looking for. I think that's that's such an important point. It's cu- I'm curious to get your thoughts on how the networking um, strategy or approach may have changed with a lot of the interactions now taking place virtually. Yes, absolutely. So um, I guess the cold calling or cold outreach through LinkedIn, for instance, is one way. Um, but job seekers themselves have their own personal network with whom, you know, they can ask, you know, for a warm introduction. And so the likelihood of the recruiter reaching out 
is is increased. And even if it's not even um, uh, in a job seeking situation, even if it's for an informational interview, and I think that's where job seekers may not be aware of the value of that type of exercise, where you seek out someone who's in that particular sector and ask them very um, well thought up questions so that you have more insight that um, you wouldn't necessarily find just by, you know, doing a Google search on the internet, for instance. Uh, But just asking for help for either a warm introduction or to get um, informational interview data, I think definitely help in addition to just the networking piece in its uh, pre-pandemic sense. Yeah, those informational interviews are so um, critical. And it's, I think, depending on, of course, the role that you are applying for, I know certain roles um, really require you to have your informational questions down, prepared, and and they have to sort of follow some sort of a structure, some sort of an order, where like one question should ideally follow the next one, and there should be some sort of a clear segue. Um, Even the way you structure your questions should, should, should show your thought process. Um, prepping for that, um, first of all, how important is it to have that informational interview? Is that something that you recommend when you do make that connection is, you know, for you to first get that informational interview in? And then what are some, some tips and tricks on how to prep for that? Sure. So informational interviews, I think, are important in your information collection process. But sometimes, you know, the person on the other end doesn't have the time or, um, doesn't have the information that you need. And that's okay. Uh, I think especially for undergraduate students who are early in their career development journey, uh, having an informational interview experience is a great to have, but it's not necessarily critical. I think sometimes positions that are not necessarily out to the public in uh, as opposed to let's say campus recruitment opportunities, which are broadcast to the university community and it's very transparent and somewhat straightforward, I think it's okay to do without. But for MBA students, I think, especially if you're looking for uh, positions that aren't necessarily broadcast or posted in the public space, that definitely helps. And just that relationship building, I think also helps because who knows, maybe the person with whom you had that informational interview can be eventually an advocate for you and say, hey, I met with Abdullah and he's extremely reliable, hardworking, strong work ethic, great performer, and could add a lot of value to a team. Yeah, yeah, again, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, when it comes to networking, are you of the mindset that it's ultimately just a numbers game? So the more you reach out, or do you think it's like a quality over quantity? What, what are your thoughts? I've always been a quality over quantity type of person. And the nature of my business, for instance, running this career center, it's really about relationship building. And, you know, when I first started this position, like over 10 years ago, you know, some of the employers were, you know, they were like the banks and the big fours and whatnot, but the top tier, like in mansion consulting, for instance, like McKinsey didn't really talk to us yet. Boston Consulting Group didn't have their office in Montreal yet. And so we really had to earn um, the respect and um, just the, the, that relationship with those firms, for instance, so that they said, okay, well, the students at this school, you know what, they, they, they really demonstrated their worth. Um, they can add a lot of value to the company. Um, they um, let's have this conversation. It took years to build that trust. And so that's where I think um, it's just really important to have those relationships and to nurture them so that they're munif- mutually beneficial and productive. Yeah, that nurturing component is so important. And I can speak out of personal experience. I know when I had initially moved to Toronto, Um, like I had made a couple of really good connections right at the beginning, but, um, you know, just making a conscious effort to nurture those relationships and periodically just check in, uh, makes such a big difference. And I think it's one of the things that, uh, perhaps I don't know if people overlook, or maybe it's just not given as much importance. I think perhaps, uh, more importance is just given to, establishing that initial connection and once you've been successful in doing that perhaps you know individuals feel as though that that's enough and that that should eventually lead to something but as you mentioned just being able to nurture that connection that relationship is so important um are there any effective um approaches or strategies for that you know do you just do you recommend just reaching out periodically um what's the best way to keep in touch yeah so to your point i mean 
just try not to make it transactional because I think people on the receiving end can, can sense that and it, there's just a lack of authenticity um, and that will definitely um, undermine your credibility and that sense of trust between the parties. And I think, you know, for those relationships to nurture and to cultivate them, just, you know, a regular pinging in, or if you came across an article or some sort of story that you feel would be relevant and of interest to that person, send it to them and say, hey, I was thinking about you. And when I came across this, it was up your alley and it relates to, you know, the last thing we talked about when, whenever it was. And I think it, people appreciate that. You know, like when I reach out to a person that I haven't spoken to 10 years, I literally tell them it's been 10 years since we last spoke. And it was in this context with that person. And I think they really appreciate that it wasn't just some, you know, superficial glossed over message that you sent. You cast a big net and tried to see what you can catch from that conversation. And um, people do take the time to respond because they appreciate that care and thought. Okay, so here's a question that I have for you, um, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on it. Maintaining your virtual presence, and by that I mean being active on LinkedIn, um, how critical is that? I know when I uh, when I was at Concordia and when I had spoken with um, you know with members of your team, um, I remember one of the suggestions was make sure that your LinkedIn profile has is optimized, and there were multiple different things within that that you know one had to address. How important do you uh, do you feel that is, and do you feel um, that that is something that undergraduate students should perhaps address as soon as they start their their education process? Yes, yes, absolutely. Especially if you're in the early phases of your career development, um, at the minimum, put a photograph um, because it's been scientifically proven that when you have a photograph, the likelihood of someone clicking on it, especially if it's a recruiter that's looking for talent, gets a hit. Um, again, you don't have to go into great detail for the different sections. Um, and some people, you know, do it the lazy way and they make just cut and paste with in the resume and whatnot, but just to give your profile and your application some color and some depth, I think is important. Uh, and as you go on, like with time, yes, interact and, and comment or congratulate, you know, someone who has like some sort of breakthrough or celebratory type of announcement. Um, and I think LinkedIn over the years, like it's an interactive space. Um, you can comment and get to learn things, but I think there are so many different forms of information, like podcasts, I think have just completely exploded. And I think those are good ways to also exchange information. And so LinkedIn today compared to like 10 years ago, I think is just so different. And the algorithms now I'm sure are set in such a way that you'll see things that you that resonate with you based on your previous activity as well and so um i think besides linkedin other ways of communicating uh especially in the career space are, are definitely options as well so um what would be some of those those other other ways and um aside from linkedin like how how would one go about navigating that? well i think now because of the pandemic everything's virtual but i think pre-pandemic, just like that in-person interaction would have been nice, whether it's through the Young Chamber of Commerce or your city's Chamber of Commerce and professional professional associations, I think are great ways to have those exchanges and relationship building opportunities. And just, you know, um, C2, sorry, yeah, C2MTL, which was this huge business and creative conference that was held in uh, May of every year in Montreal, I think was what they called, you know, like um, you have these brain dates where you have an opportunity to sit with someone and just talk about like a, a topic that both of you find fascinating. And those platforms, unfortunately, are not available now, but hopefully once we're on the other side, uh, we'll, we'll be able to interact in those ways as well. Yeah, it's uh, I couldn't agree more. In fact, one of my uh, friends here um, got an insanely good job working at uh, one of the banks in their um, in their trading team, um, and he got it through attending um, conferences. You know where you essentially had data scientists and business analysts get together and, and speak about you know different topics. Um, and it was at one of those events where he was able to network and build those connections and then eventually landed a fantastic job. 
So exactly. I couldn't agree more with your advice on going to those, uh, you know, outside of LinkedIn, making sure that you attend those conferences, those, you know, those meetup groups, those, those different ways for you to essentially interact with individuals who are either in your field or in your field or in a field that you are looking to get into. I think it's, it's, it's critical. Um, I'm curious for undergraduate students, um, does the approach change at all throughout there um, throughout the different years, you know, coming in as a freshman, you know, are there certain things you need to focus on versus in your senior year and your final year? Are there other things that you should perhaps be focusing on just to improve the likelihood of your of you landing a job when you do exit uh, the university? Absolutely. And I think a great starting point would be like one's resume for an undergraduate student. Let's say it's your first year your resume may be a little um, sparse because the professional piece has not yet been developed, which is completely normal. And I think that's where you need to draw on, you know, um, outside of the classroom, what type of activities, community service, uh, volunteer work, um, community service, uh, sorry, uh, that you may have done that can demonstrate your capacity to organize your time, manage relationships, um, and be organized in general. And then as you progress into like year two or year three, that's where you can, you know, talk about your coursework and which uh, classes you did best and what type of um, areas within your field of study that you're going to be interested in. And I would hope that's an opportunity for um, an undergraduate student to be involved in extracurricular activities, whether it's student government, associations, um, advocacy. And so that way you just build on your skill set build on your knowledge, build on your experiences. And as you approach the senior years, that's where you'll have to flex your um, career building um, development muscles and just be more proactive on the recruitment uh, activity piece. So in addition to your resume, building your LinkedIn profile, which would reflect a lot of the items that that are on your resume. Um, But also that's the point where you talk about, you know, these are the advanced courses that you may have taken or projects that you may have, you know, um, completed and draw from those experiences so that you have story to tell during the the interview process as your applications go through the um, recruitment uh, piece. Yeah, I think that's such a great point, like being active when it comes to the recruitment piece in your senior year, just because there's so many opportunities and there's so much going on at that particular point in time. Uh, just to make sure that you are prioritizing those activities over some of the other activities and just making sure that you uh, stay on top of those and continue to, I think, continue to network in your senior year is is so important. Like that's um, extremely critical. Um, And looking at the um, graduate students, um, for them, how would their approach differ from undergraduate students? Of course, you know, if you're a graduate student, you've likely got some prior work experience that you already have on your resume, so you can always leverage that in your conversations. But does the strategy, does the approach change if you're a graduate student? The strategy, I guess, would differ depending on what you're trying to get out of your graduate study. So if we're looking at the MBA, for instance, and um, as you know, having been an MBA student yourself, um, there, there are students from a, a variety of um, fields. Um, but again, we're I think the stats are still like about 30% are like engineers, for instance. And I think that's where you have to leverage those non-business skills and optimize them in such a way that it's like a a cross-pollination between the technical piece and the business piece. Um, For graduate students who are doing like MSCs, for instance, that are more research-based, the professional experience may be a bit lighter, but here's a great opportunity to demonstrate your capacity to think critically to synthesize information succinctly and to communicate effectively by writing a thesis or by defending your thesis, for instance. So I think in each, in their own different ways, the graduate students would have a different approach simply because they have, you know, a couple of years of experience, they're more mature, the type of jobs they're aiming for are different, but at the core, the networking piece, the application preparation piece, um, outreach to recruitment and seeking out the career uh, center resources, I think remain the same. And the coaching for like the interviews and when you're go- negotiating the offer that's being presented, I think those remain the same regardless of what part of the university journey you're in. Yeah, and I want to get more into that coaching for interviews uh, piece. So let's assume, you know, you've done your networking, your resume is on point, um, you get that call from the recruiter and now you're you're in the interview stage of the recruitment process. 
Um, how do you, uh, what are some of your t suggestions for how to prepare for that interview? Um, I know, of course, at Concordia, we've got a ton of really good resources. You can do case interview preps, um, depending on the kind of interview it is, whether it's a behavioral, whether it's a technical interview, there's different resources. But I'm curious to hear, you know, what are your, what are some of your top suggestions on how to navigate through that? If possible, find out what to expect. Uh, some industries, like in management consulting, for instance, they'll use case interview approaches. Uh, if you can find out in advance for the recruiter, and many of them are very transparent as to how many rounds there are, so you know how to schedule your time to prepare accordingly. Um, and then try to do mock interviews, meaning you have a practice session or two with a career advisor or someone who has experience interviewing people. And worst comes to worst, you can do it, you know, video yourself. And there are some resources online, like interview stream that can give you feedback on your um, interview performance, you know, and practice really does perfect. Um, that being said, I, I don't think it's a good idea to over rehearse because then you will come across as too um, artificial. And the interview exercise really is an interview for both parties, for the job seeker and the employer. And it's an opportunity to exchange, get to know each other, but also to get a sense if the fit is there between um, the potential employee and employer. And so um, storytelling, I think, is key when you're conveying, you know, your um value proposition. But again, it needs to be natural. And um, if it's overly rehearsed, uh, I don't think it's good for the uh, job seeker. Yeah, it's it's such great advice. Um, and you're exactly right. Try, you know, trying to figure out what you are expected to, uh, to deliver. You know, like, as you mentioned, if you're doing, if you're interviewing for consulting roles, you know, certain organizations will have certain types of case studies and certain types of formats that they prefer over others. Um, I know some of the, uh, the sort of the bulge bracket uh, consulting firms, some of the top ones, McKinsey, Bain, BCG, they have a very different type of uh, case interview format versus, you know, Accenture or a PWC. So make sure you do uh, quite a bit of research and try and understand what it is that they're looking for. And then you can prep accordingly for that. On the behavioral side, how important is it to nail that behavioral interview? Oftentimes, um, you know, um, and I know individuals who perhaps have, have, uh, have been guilty of doing this themselves, but they've focused more on the technical component of the interview and just making sure that they have that down and not really uh, giving too much thought to the behavioral side of the interview. And, and and just curious to get your thoughts on that. I think it's important, of course. I think the tendency to practice on the technical piece is because it's a skill that um, that will definitely gauge, you know, whether you have what it takes to do the work. And I think because of that, people tend to focus too much or may neglect the behavioral piece as a result. And I think the behavioral piece is important because it's an opportunity to demonstrate your values and your interests and that goodness of fit between you and the position. Yeah, no, that's uh, making sure you have the behavioral questions um, down and prepped is, is is so important. And I know um, like I've interacted with individuals who um, tend to list all of the different behavioral questions that they could potentially on, uh, potentially get asked. And then uh, for each one of those, they have a ton of you know bullet points and, and things that they put down. Um, and for each of the behavioral questions, um, there's often the suggestion that you should use the, um, I believe it's called, is it called the STAR approach? Yes. Um, and, and essentially, so what does that stand for? I, I, it's, is it situation, task, action, action. And, then, and then was it response or? Yes. Yeah. Um, and it's basically just using that as a, a, a method to come up with your responses for each of the behavioral questions, correct? Yes. It offers a framework. So that way, when you're guiding the interviewee, uh, sorry, the interviewer in your response, there's a nice flow, a logical sequence of, event, of events to understand how you went about that situation. Yeah, it's um, it's something that I've used as well previously, and it, it seems to have worked uh, quite well. Um, one of the things that I'm curious to uh, hear about is um, when we think about the job market today, and you know, there's a ton of job postings, but when you take a look at the number of applications that these job postings get, you know, just looking at uh, LinkedIn, for example, you see that there is a ton of um, there's a ton of interest, and that there, it's extremely competitive. Um, so, how does 
is there something in, and perhaps there's no answer to this, but is there, you know, something that you can definitively say, hey, you know, like skill, for, let's assuming, let's assume you've got two candidates, they've got, you know, the exact same skills. Um, what is it that sets sets one apart from the other? Is it networking? Is it having that personal connection, perhaps with the recruiter? Do we, is there, you know, what what is there, if anything? I think definitely the relational piece. Um, you know, you've gone through, I'm sure, many interviews over your career. And as you meet, you know, the representatives of the firm, like the last round normally is what, either with partners or senior leadership, right? And I think it's just the interactions and just the tacit part of the interactions. And it's essentially, can I count on this person if we were stuck in a jam? Um, if we have to work long hours, can we stand to be in each other's presence? And can I count on this person to, to make things happen? And I think that's where if you have two equally um, talented candidates in front of you, it's going to be that relational piece, um, that human piece that will be the deciding factor to determine the outcome. And is that something that COVID has presented an additional challenge for in the sense that you don't necessarily have that human connection? Like, are there certain COVID related challenges that have come up? I think so. Um, And I think also, um, given the um, remote working um, reality that we're in, um, also the demand from employer uh, employees nowadays, sorry, who want more flexibility um, in their work schedules and arrangements, I think those are definitely going to impact the outcome. And I guess it depends on the, the personality of um, the hiring manager. You know, like if someone's more, I guess, old fashioned, for lack of a better expression, who really wants to see the person come into the office and work a very linear schedule of nine to five and the uh, incumbent or potential incumbent is one who wants more flexibility. I think off the bat, you can tell there might be, you know, um, uh, uh, a poor goodness of fit between the two. And so I think COVID definitely has impacted those um, hiring outcomes and decisions along the way. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how this whole thing plays out, especially with uh, a lot of organizations bringing in a hybrid um uh, approach to working. So a couple of days at home and a couple of days in the office, it's going to be interesting to see how individuals are able to cope with that. Um, yeah. you know, and I would imagine that if, um, there is that sort of uncertainty there in terms of routine that perhaps it could create problems, but I would imagine that organizations probably navigate around that. They probably have certain things in place to uh, provide, um, provide their staff with the sense of, you know, uh, certainty and just help them, um, I guess restructure their their routines given you know um, the new the new way we're supposed to be working. Um, I'm curious to hear when it comes to recruiters and when it comes to employers, um, have you started to see perhaps a shift in the types of skills that they are looking for in their candidates? Um, you know, perhaps uh, certain if it's not technical traits, you know, perhaps it's something else. But are you starting to see that at all? Or are there certain things that stick out to you where, you know, one could say, hey, you know, these are the skill sets that you want to be uh, looking to build and develop. And these are the skill sets that recruiters are looking for. Right. Yes. If anything, now I think the buzzwords are adaptability, agility, dependency. Um, and I think because of the work remote work conditions, you know, you don't have that spontaneity of just passing by someone's desk to follow up on something. And so that's where I think, um, in addition to these skills, um, you know, the capacity to use certain uh, tools, I think, definitely help to demonstrate your capacity to, you know, be dependable. So whether it's like on Slack or on Teams or whatnot, um, I think those definitely make a difference as well. But the adaptability piece, and being able to turn things around quickly, to think on your feet very quickly and just problem solve. I think those are the classic skills. But in addition to that, being highly adaptable and being able to work under pressure. And I think the pressure is coming in all directions nowadays, I think would make a candidate stand out. And what about in terms of actual roles, like jobs? Um, are we starting to see perhaps more roles for you know um, business analysts, data scientists, um, what are, is there, 
is there at all a, a shift in the types of jobs that are being posted? Um, actually, at the career center now, I think there's still a lot of the traditional classic roles, so like business analysts, financial analysts, associates for the graduate students, whatnot. Um, but if you go more into like the different uh, functional roles, like in marketing, for instance, now like there's the digital marketing where they'll be more specific and precise in the type of requirements for the roles. Uh, but again, I think the labor shortage is such that now employers are just they're just desperate for almost anyone at this point um they just need extra hands on deck to make things happen and again we as a career center need to be mindful that certain positions yes we're more than happy to post but other positions that just are not a good fit for our students that are business university students um they're just better off posting elsewhere because the the traction rate is going to be low and it just won't be um professionally rewarding for our students. So we're very mindful to keep the job post um, postings and the job board as relevant as possible for business students. Yeah, your your point on, you know, the within marketing, like having a greater focus being given to like the digital side of things, like it's, it's so true. And I think it's uh, in terms of trends, you know, uh, anybody looking to get into the job market, whether you're an undergraduate student or you're a graduate student, and, you know, let's just take the case of marketing. Like if, if that's a field that you are interested in, you know, being aware of, uh, of the trends, you know, um, and I had, uh, just recently somebody on the podcast who, uh, was speaking about influencer marketing. So he, um, yes. his, his organization, plays within the influencer marketing space. And he was saying that the market is expected to explore over the next couple of years. It already has been, but in terms of growth, uh, there's going to be an exponential increase within um, within the influencer marketing space. So for individuals who are looking to get into marketing, for example, um, you know, being aware of what those trends are and then being aware of like what those jobs within those fields um, require you to have the, the, the types of skills. So if you're looking, of course, to get into influencer marketing, you know, you need to be uh, well aware of all the different social media platforms that are out there, how they function, um, what are some of the, the um, uh, what are some of the best practices when it comes to actually engaging with individuals on these platforms. So it's, it's, it's good to have a good sense of, you know, which role you're looking to get into, what those trends are, and then trying to figure out what the requirements are for roles within those particular, um, yeah. Are there any, aside from, you know, like digital marketing, are there any other things that really stand out to you in terms of like trends, in terms of like where perhaps, uh, the job market will head and where there'll be more roles in, in the future? Well, in terms of curriculum development, I don't think uh, we're catching up fast enough. I think all universities suffer from this, where you're developing the curriculum, and yet by the time you roll it out, it may not necessarily meet industry needs because they've already moved on to something else. So I think this is where students or job seekers in general can supplement their own learning in addition to the foundations that they gain um, through the university experience. So for finance students, learn about what's going on with like the cryptocurrencies. Like I'm not saying that, you know, you need to be well-versed, but just have an idea of how they work and, you know, how they're affecting markets. Like I know in China, I think they're going to be, they will be made illegal soon, if not already. And um, how that's just completely changing the, the, the level playing field, you know, in the markets in general. Um, for those who are in HR, for instance, you know, this interview processes now are so different. Like the video interviews are almost like a step one for most jobs. Um, and then interview tools, you know, um, a lot of them are now gamified and you're, you're, you're drawing on data about the applicant in a very different way as opposed to a traditional in-person interview with very straightforward situational type of questions. Uh, accountancy, I think now um, with um, blockchain, you know, and just having that ledger and, and how you, you account for things, I think are, are, are very different than your traditional just, um, audit and those tools that have been used in the past. And for supply chain, I mean, the world is their oyster at this point. Like there's so many supply chain management challenges to face and different tools and theories and frameworks to work with. I think it's a very exciting time for students that would be studying in that particular field as well. Yeah, I I, I totally agree. And I think uh, essentially what it's pointing to is just the impact that technology is having on a lot of these traditional um, roles, right? So you mentioned, for example, blockchain, you mentioned um 
how, for example, the supply chain world has seen change. You know, of course, the uh, the impact of certain software and tools has really um, has really made things a lot easier for supply chain professionals. But at the same time, um, you know, it's just something new that you now have to be aware of, and 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 another skill that you have to take up. So outside of you know, your, um, perhaps like there's opportunity for you to take like additional, uh, I think learning never stops. And, uh, I think it's something that, you know, is a lifelong process. And I think we see that now and you see a lot of individuals who are extremely successful, you know, uh, who once they are done with, you know, their graduate studies that they do end up taking courses every now and then. And you see that, you know, getting added to their resumes, getting added to their profiles on, on LinkedIn. In fact, I, myself, I'm take I'm looking to take a course um, on on disruptive strategy because I think it's something that will augment the work that I'm doing as well as uh, you know just help me stay more um, in tune with what's going on around me from a disruptive strategy and innovation standpoint. So I totally agree, and I think it's it's something you know for for undergraduate students and for graduate students and and me being you know having gone through the process myself. Um, I would definitely say, you know, make sure that you do take advantage of all the resources that you have at your university, you know, make sure that you are going to the, um, the career fairs and that you are networking there and that you're, you know, building some sort of a, or at least having that initial interaction that, that you can then build upon and nurture, um, do take advantage of, um, um, you know, the mock interview resources that you have and, you know, being able to practice that I think is so key. And I know, in fact, individuals who I had recently studied with and who um, got some pretty impressive roles within consulting, um, but, you know, um, they were able to do that because they practiced relentlessly, you know, case interviews with one another. And I think that's that's such, an, uh, that's such a key point. Um, one of the concern or one of the things that, uh, and this is just a thought that I have, but like when I take a look at the, 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 the job market, um, and you had mentioned something that I wasn't aware of, and you were saying that, you know, employers are looking for, they're looking for, for hands on deck. They're looking to, you know, uh, get people into certain roles. Would you, would it be fair to say though, that, um, as we look to the future, that irrespective of the type of role that the competition for those roles will just continue to increase? Is that fair to say? Well, I guess the demand will, will, will continue to be strong. Like as, if you look at the population, like baby boomers now are retiring and that knowledge base, that leaves a very big void. And um, we, we need to replace these people eventually, but the, the people are coming in uh, through the funnel, I mean, they're still pretty junior and their skills need to be built over time. And so there's this huge dilemma, like how do you go about replacing all that institutional memory with people who have just arrived? And that's where that constant upskilling that you just brought up is extremely relevant. Well, there are a lot of different platforms to speed up that learning, but it just it ultimately takes time. And I think that's where we're going to sort of reach this point where um, the demand is huge, uh, but the supply of talent to make things happen, it's just, it's going to take time to catch up. And I think uh, for everyone, we just need to be compassionate and kind and patient. Um, but unfortunately, in certain businesses, that, that that pressure is so strong that they're just you can't you can't wait. And I think that's what makes it all the more competitive. And whomever can you know close the deal as close as quickly as possible because they they're staffed with. The talent that can make things happen quickly and efficiently are the ones who are going to be coming out winning on top at the end. Okay, so that's a great point. And I want to come back to uh, something that we had spoken about earlier. So I have a couple of questions. So we spoke about, you know, how to uh, make sure that when you do have that interview that you're all set to go. And we talked about the, the preparation that goes behind it. Let's assume you've now landed the, the job and uh, the, it comes time for you to perhaps do a bit of negotiation. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Is, is that something where you say, you know, um, get just get your foot in the door and then like once you're in there and as you're looking to move up, you can then start, sort of start to negotiate because you've, you know, at this point already proven yourself, you know, you've shown that you're a valuable team member and that you've got the right skills. Um, are you um, are, are you sort of in that um, um, camp of thought or are you more, you know, as you're getting in, make sure you negotiate and get what it is that you're looking for? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I tend to be more of a 
long term person,、uh, or at least the mindset is more long term.、Uh, because so you you've been offered the position. The conditions are good to start with,、um, and I think you need to earn your, your your stripes, so to speak, and demonstrate your value proposition. And it's it's a relationship, and therefore, depending on how the employer you know interacts with you as you're together on this journey, and and you have this alliance, that's where you can negotiate and say, okay, well, I did these things in return. Can you are you comfortable with this type of arrangement? Whether it's negotiating for an increase in、uh, salary or a promotion in a position for a better title or for more vacation days or more flexibility in how you schedule your own time, and some people who you know may have. Family commitments and responsibilities、uh, may not be able to work、um, five days a week, and maybe they'll work four, but at eighty percent of the the pay. And so I think it takes time. I I, I wouldn't be one to rush into、uh, negotiating everything upfront、um, simply because, like, unless the conditions that were initially proposed are unreasonable. But if they start off as reasonable, I think it's okay to to take your time and and you. I would hope you know like. Each party is in there for for the long haul, so that it's a mutually productive and beneficial experience for both、uh, both sides. Yeah, that's a that's that's a fair、uh, point, and I think that's、uh, that's good advice as well. I think、uh, ultimately, you know, both sides are looking to、um, grow and nurture that relationship, and they want what's best for the relationship because ultimately, employers you know want good candidates. They want.、Um, Individuals who will be loyal, who will stay, who will grow with the organization, and on the flip side, you know, um, um, candidates are looking for good employers. So I think it's you're exactly right.、Um, I did, and we. I'm not sure if we touched upon this earlier, but what I wanted to get your thoughts on is we talked about, of course, like some of the. You know things that you should be doing、um, if you want to be successful, making sure that you know as you're if you're a new undergrad, focus on your resume, focus on certain certain things to make sure that you are setting yourself up for success. Are there certain things that come to you、um, where you look at them and you're like, for undergraduate students, there are certain things that they do that perhaps they shouldn't be doing. That there are certain you know mistakes that are are frequently made that can be easily avoided. Um, and are do we have that same view for graduate students, where you know perhaps graduate students come in and you know either they don't take advantage of certain things or they do certain things but they don't necessarily do them the right way? Do we have that at all?、Yeah. I think for the do's and don'ts, like if you like the spectrum of things, and I think they're universal whether you're a graduate or undergraduate student. So as you're preparing for your application, like I know it's. It, looking for a job is a job, so it takes a lot of effort and it takes time because you need to do your research and you need to personalize the documents,、um, and and customize them. So what I normally tell students is that it's that 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 resume you send out, like have your sort of generic bank of skills and experiences and whatnot in one document and extract the ones that are most relevant to the needs of the position based on the conversation with. The recruiter or on the job posting, so that way you filter out all the unnecessary components to make a very succinct and、um, efficient document. Because your resume is very valuable real estate. What you put on it literally demonstrates your worth in the eyes of the recruiter. So don't put anything that they don't care about. Just put the things that they really want to zero in, so that your application stands out. And that again is both for、uh, undergrad and graduate students. So just attention to detail, making sure there are no spelling errors, making sure you put the correct company's name in the cover letter that you're sending out to, you know, that a potential employer. But then I think on the other、uh, side of the spectrum, in terms of severity of like don't do, is、um, reneging on an offer. Meaning, you've been presented with an offer, you've given either a verbal or written、um, response that you've accepted it. And then try to trade that for another position elsewhere, and then coming back to the first employer and saying, "Oh well, you know, on second thought, I don't want the job anymore." That's just terrible, and we've seen this happen. Not often, thank goodness, but we've seen it often enough that we need to remind students that that is just simply wrong. It's unethical, and it reflects poorly both on the individual and on the business school. And again, it's it's all relational, and that negative experience. For the employer and for the hiring company, it it, it will come back and and bite that person in the long run because the business community in Montreal, at least, it's pretty small. People talk, 
And if that recruiter ended up at another company and came across that, you know, applicant's name and application again, I'm pretty sure it's going to go straight to, you know, the, the rubbish bin. So I think it's very important for people to build their uh, integrity and their um, reputation over time and to think very critically about the impact of certain decisions early on and how it might affect them down the road. Okay, so coming back to that renegging on the offer, is that happening because this, and I'm just thinking out loud here, is that happening because like, you know, the individual gets the offer, is still interviewing with other organizations? And yes, then typically is waiting- that is the case. Okay, so that's interesting, right? Like, because we, we, and I'm just being devil's advocate here, like different companies have different timelines for their interview process. So, you know, what, how does one make sure that they're not giving up one opportunity um, or that they can at least lock in one opportunity while they're still interviewing with another organization? Uh, Because what happens in the case where you get an offer and, you know, you're like, well, let's assume this is like my second choice. I'm still interviewing with, with my number one choice. Um, I haven't heard back from them yet. Um, Should I say no to this offer and continue interviewing with the first one? And then perhaps like have have this risk still be there of me not getting that offer as well, in which case I don't have any job. Or does one, you know, go ahead and take this offer? And then, you know, if if they say no, then at least you have this job. And then if they say yes, then sure, you're in a horrible situation because you've given this employer a word already. But at the same time, you're also safeguarding yourself. It's a tricky, situ- tricky situation to be in. Indeed, it, it's very thorny. And again, there, there's... Um, I think the applicant needs to be as transparent as possible. And I think recruiters expect it, especially with very bright, coveted uh, applicants in the job market, and they need to act fast. And I think this is where the applicant needs to be transparent with the recruiters with whom they're interviewing. And it can be three or four simultaneously, especially in a very competitive job market and say, listen, I'm, um, I've applied for several similar positions at, you know, your competitors or at other firms. And um, the timeline is such, and I've received an offer from, well, you can keep it confidential, obviously, but, you know, I've received an offer and I have a deadline to meet in order to give them a decision. So is there any way to, uh, to see what the progress is in our current recruitment process so I can make a more sound decision? And, um, and then just really, really, obviously, your interest in the position, because that's why you apply. And that would just gently pressure, you know, recruiter B to make a decision as well, because they have, they stand to lose a lot as well, because they've invested all this time to interview this candidate. And they obviously want, you know, the best one that's in the pool. And again, it is a very, very delicate and thorny um, and tricky situation. I completely agree. Yeah. And I think your advice makes total sense. Be transparent. Let employer, you know, be know who you're still interviewing with that you have received an offer and then, you know, hopefully they can come back and give you some sort of direction. Um, but going back to employer, A, like is your suggestion to perhaps hold off uh, on taking the offer and maybe let them know that, hey, I'm still I'm still interviewing? You can buy time. You can always ask for more time. Again, they they have their own deadlines to meet. Um, but I think if you're reasonable and say, well, and, and this is what you know in 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 our business we have something called the exploding offers, where they give you a very unreasonable amount of time to make that um, decision, and that's unethical too. And in fact, the Canadian Association for Career Educators and Employers, we have a rule in our guidelines where exploding offers are, are not permitted because. It's just not reasonable to give someone just like a day to decide yay or nay, especially when they are interviewing with other firms as well. So it just makes it a bit more equitable for everyone. And of course, you know, if someone gives you the offer, you ask for, you know, if they give you two days, you can ask for a bit more because you're waiting to hear back. Uh, And then that way, at least all recruiters know they're all on the same page. And for the applicant, you know, it just preserves in many ways their integrity and their reputation. Does it reflect negatively at all on the applicant, though, if they go to employer and they say, hey, like I'm still interviewing, um, you know, I'd like to see what the outcome of my interview with this organization is. Like, would it be fair to say that in the eyes of employer A, um, that this particular candidate is, is you know, somebody who is looking um, for something else instead and really like employer A is just plan B or option B? Like, is that a concern? Yeah, I mean, that's a very valid point you bring. Uh, maybe in, in disclosing to 
you know, employer A who has presented you with an offer to say, I, I need more time to reflect. And I think that is enough and also code for, you know, I'm still interviewing elsewhere. And I think for a recruiter, they're mindful of that. They're aware of that. They're, they're being realistic as well. Um, but I think it's just it's um, it's a, just a sign of courtesy and respect to say, um, I just need a bit more time. Can you give it to me? And if you can't, then it's for the incumbent, the applicant, to decide whether they are going to, where how they're going to distribute the risk at the expense of, let's say, the other job. But again, the bottom line is to say yes and then to turn around and say no is just not the way to go. Yeah, no, I I totally agree. It's something that you want to absolutely avoid and be as transparent in the process um, and not have to make a commitment and then have to take that back. Um, unless if, you know, I don't know, I would imagine that there would be certain situations where like, you know, you would reach out to, you know, the employer that you're still interviewing with and perhaps they get back to you and say, hey, like we, sorry, like I can't, can't really say anything at the moment. We're still just taking our time. In which case you're like, okay, I don't really have a sense of like when I'll hear back from this organization, but at the same time I have to get back. So it's a, it's such a d- tough spot to be in. And, um, you know, it's, um, I, I, I'm not sure if a lot of individuals actually end up being in that, uh, or perhaps there are certain candidates who get, you know, multiple offers at the same time, or perhaps are in, have received an offer and they're still interviewing with somebody else who they really want to join. Um, but I think the best advice to your point is be as transparent with both, with both parties as you possibly can be. Um, and, um, hopefully whatever's best will come out of that. Um, yeah, I think, um, I do want to say though, while I was at Concordia that, uh, I was extremely, um, your team had provided some extremely valuable support and guidance. And I was able to do, you know, I was able to take advantage of a lot of the the resources that your team had. Um, and I had a really good relationship with a lot of the individuals on the team as well. Um, extremely helpful. And they had done quite a lot for, um, you know, not just myself, but a lot of the individuals that I had studied with. Um, is there, is there anything that's, you know, that that's on your plate, like for uh, 2022, as you look, to, you know, perhaps um, as you look at things, perhaps returning more to normalcy, uh, are there certain things that, you know, you're looking to perhaps like uh, bring in that, you know, that it, that is either different or that's innovative or, um, you know, what's sort of on your, uh, on your agenda? Sure. So thanks for your very kind words, uh, Abdullah, because you've been very active yourself. So uh, being in the student association, being the president, I think that already demonstrates um, a great character trait that makes a job seeker stand out to begin with because of that extracurricular involvement. Um, Looking to the future when it comes to uh, job search or career services, um, I think the, the virtual mode is here to stay simply because for employers, it's very efficient for them to do their outreach reach. Um, Travel expenses are nil at this point. They're not having to fly from one campus to another to do the outreach. Uh, Having said that, I think the in-person experience of of, of interacting and and doing the recruitment and the networking, um, that's pretty hard to replace. So I think maybe certain schools will be very selective as to which schools they will travel to to meet their students. Um, For students, for the job seekers, regardless of your MBA or undergraduate, seek out the resources at your school. Speak to a career advisor. Um, Our offices are open for in-person services, but also virtual as well. And um, talk to your friends. Talk to you know, trusted family members uh, and um, seek out information. I mean, there are so many different avenues to get that information, whether it's through professional associations, student associations, um, chamber of commerce, for instance, and for the female audience members, um, there's in Montreal, for instance, uh, LFA, which is um, uh, a women um, leadership development program, and the A stands for ambition. And there are different, I'm sure, similar um, uh, providers in, in Toronto as well, where it's to nurture uh, that female talent. And I think, you know, with employers focusing on, on diversity, on the equity piece, inclusion, um, it's just an exciting time. There's just so much out there. And I think the virtual um, tools out there just make it uh, more accessible to all. And that's where students should take advantage of those opportunities. Yeah. And I think, again, it's uh, it's invaluable advice. And I think, again, you know, I look at the job market and th- thankfully I don't, um, you know, I'm not in a situation where I'm looking for a, um, 
where I'm actively looking for an opportunity. But um, I just see that, you know, there's quite a few challenges, you know, be it if you are irrespective of whether you are a student, undergraduate or graduate looking to get, you know, a job once you get done with the university or whether you are currently, you know, employed and you're looking for your next role. You know, I, I feel as though there are definitely um, certain challenges um, that you will encounter just because it, it's extremely competitive. It's it's quite competitive and certainly some roles are more competitive than others. Um, so the advice that you gave has been critical. Um, I wanted to thank you for, for being on the podcast. Um, and um, for everybody that's tuning in, you know, you know the jam. Please make sure that you like, share and subscribe. And I will uh, see you on the next one.